tribulation will take place on this earth for seven years. At the end of the seven year tribulation, the second coming of Christ takes place. Now here's where the disconnect is for most people who get confused about the future. The rapture and the second coming of Christ are not the same thing. The rapture is when Jesus comes back to take his people back to heaven with him, then tribulation on the earth takes place, and then the second coming is when Jesus comes back and the Bible says he comes with all of the people of God and with all the angels and sets up his kingdom on this earth. Now here's the answer to that young girl's question. There are no signs for the rapture. The rapture could happen at any time. But the New Testament is filled with signs for the second coming. But guess what? Every event casts its shadow before us. So if there are signs for the second advent, and they tell us that the second advent is coming, that means the rapture seven years before that, so the rapture is surely coming, isn't it? So when we study the prophecies of the Bible and we see the regathering of Israel and we see the collection of the nations of Europe and we see all the things that are happening on the prophetic scene, what we know is this, our redemption is drawing nigh. The Bible tells us that Jesus is going to come back and I've, I know I might embarrass myself a little bit by saying this, but I tell people everywhere I go, I expect to be here when Jesus comes back for the rapture. I believe that things are so close that if the Lord lets me live out my life, I'm going to see the rapture. And I've come up with a little slogan, I'd rather see the upper taker than the undertaker, wouldn't you? I'm really looking forward to that. I am. Now, according to the book of Revelation, when Jesus comes back for the second advent, every eye shall see him. But when the rapture happens, it's going to be very quickly, very quietly happening. And it is the answer to the promise that Jesus made in John chapter 14. Do you remember? When Jesus was about to go away after his disciples had understood his death, burial, and resurrection a little bit, and Jesus was preparing them for what was to happen, and they didn't understand it, and some of them said, Lord, where are you going? And Lord, how do you get there? And Jesus said to them in John 14, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you, and I go to prepare this place for you so that I can come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And the rapture is the fulfillment of that promise of the Lord Jesus. He has gone to heaven, he is preparing a place for us, and one day soon he's going to come back and he's going to take us up to meet him in the air, and we're going to go to the place that he's been preparing. Now, if the Lord created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh, he's been working on heaven for several thousand years. Can you imagine what kind of place that's going to be? I mean, it is going to be a place like anything you have ever seen in your life. And the hope of the believer is this, that before tribulation breaks out on this earth, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. Now, the real... The real text that teaches this truth is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The writer of this passage begins by giving to his readers a preview of what's going to happen in the future, sort of a little overture of these events. And he begins by trying to dispel their ignorance. He begins in verse 13 by saying, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. And I've observed that whenever that passage is referred to in the scripture, whenever that little phrase is in the scripture, you know what it means? They're ignorant brethren. <laughs> it means they don't know what they need to know. In fact, uh, J. Vernon McGee once said that the largest congregation in the world was the congregation of the ignorant brethren. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. He was a little more uh, edgy than I would be. But the apostle begins by using this phrase that shows that the Thessalonians didn't understand what was going on. So he's writing this to dispel their ignorance. And you know, one of the reasons we study the Bible is so we can learn things we don't know. So we need to open our Bibles and ask God to help us understand what the scripture says. The first thing that he does after he dispels their ignorance is he describes a believer's death. And this is a very interesting thing. Notice what he says. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. The word that is used of Christians who have died in the text of the New Testament is a word which is, the meaning of the word is to sleep, but to sleep in death. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have 
fallen asleep. Did you know that if you're a Christian, death is just like falling asleep? Just like falling asleep. That's what the Bible says. And we're going to learn why in just a moment. The early Christians had this wonderful word for the burying places of their dead. The Greek word is koimaterion, and don't get caught up in that word, but it means a rest house for strangers, a sleeping place. Now, hang on. It is the same word from which we get our English word cemetery. The same word was used in that day for inns or hotels or motels, like the Ramada Inn or the Holiday Inn. The same word that was used for cemetery was used for hotels. And you expect to get up the next day when you go to a hotel and continue your journey. And this is the picture of the place where you bury your believing loved ones. The body of the believer has just been put into a hotel until the resurrection. Isn't that an interesting thought? So where's my loved one? Oh, they're in the hotel down here at the cemetery. I mean, that'll open some people's eyes. It'll start a conversation for you if you want one. One day the Lord is going to come back and that body is going to be raised up. And the main truth here that we need to remember is just as physically we sleep and we expect to awake tomorrow in the hotels where we're staying, so as Christians, when we die, we can be assured that one day we'll be awakened by the return of the Lord, we'll come out of those hotels, and we'll go to be with the Lord in the heavens. What a great truth. Now, after he dispels their ignorance and he describes their death, he defends the believer's hope. And this is what he says. Lest you sorrow, he says, I want you to know this truth so you won't sorrow like others who don't have any hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord Jesus came into this world to take the sting out of death. And what that means is that though we do sorrow when we lose somebody we love, We don't sorrow like the other part of the world who doesn't know him because we know that death is not the end. In fact, it's the beginning of something much better than we've ever experienced before. Now, here's why we don't have to sorrow. Here's where our hope is. Notice what he says in verses 13 and 14. He says, if we believe that Jesus died and he rose again, is it too hard to believe that he can perform the same miracle in your life and in mine? I mean, this explains how Christ took the sting out of death for believers. He's changed what would have been death into sleep by his own death. This then is the cause for not grieving. I'm not afraid to die. I don't want to die. I'm like the little boy in the class who the teacher said, how many of you want to go to heaven when you die? Everybody raised their hand but one little boy in the back row and she went back and she said, son, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? Oh, he said, yeah, when I die, but I thought you were getting up a load for tonight. You know what? I don't want to go to heaven tonight. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I want to go to heaven when God's ready to take me to heaven, and I'm not afraid to go to heaven because I know that there is something far better awaiting us because of our faith in Christ. Now, in the next part of this section of Scripture, verse 15, we've already seen the careful preview of the rapture. Now we're going to see the promise of the rapture. Notice verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. And he begins in verses 16 and 17 to outline how things are going to happen when the rapture occurs. So let's go through this little chronological, this little chronological program of the rapture, verses 16 and 17. Notice first of all, first thing, there's going to be a return. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The Bible says the next thing that's going to happen for everyone who's a Christian is the skies are going to be parted and Jesus Christ is going to come back. He's going to return to take those who have trusted in him to heaven. And notice, it's the Lord himself who is coming. He's not sending the Holy Spirit. He's not sending his angels. He's not sending any of the disciples who've gone on ahead. He himself is coming. In fact, you remember when he was taken up in in the ascension that the angel said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? 
this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven is going to come in the same manner as you saw him go into heaven. How did they see him go? They saw him go physically. They saw him go personally. So how should we expect him to come back physically and personally? Jesus Christ is coming back very soon. Now the detail of this passage is very complete. In fact, we're even given the sounds that we're going to hear before this happens. It says, the shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. Three sounds. We should be listening for these sounds, the Bible says. One day we'll be going through our emotions, living our lives, and that sound will be heard. You say, how will I know it? Well, it's going to be a sound like a trumpet, like the voice of an archangel. It's going to be that kind of a sound like you've never heard before. I promise you, when you hear it, you'll know it. <laughs> There's going to be a return. And then the Bible says there's going to be a resurrection. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. In a split second, the Lord is going to call all believers to himself to share his glory. Not one will remain behind. The Bible says that we are going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The Bible says we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So there's going to be a return. Jesus is going to come back. What's the second thing? The dead in Christ are going to be raised, and they're going to go up first. Then we who are alive and remain, we're going to be caught up to be with them in the heavens. We're going to meet our loved ones who've gone on before us, who are in the grave. They're going to, get, they're going to check out of their motel, and they're going to be caught up with us. And the Bible says we're going to meet together in the air. So there's not only a return, a resurrection, and a rapture, but there's going to be a reunion. I remember as a little boy growing up in my daddy's church, we used to sing this song, there's going to be a meeting in the air in the sweet, sweet by and by. You remember that? Well, that's not just a good lyric for a good hymn. That's the truth of the word of God. The Bible says that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our final place. Our final place where we're going to be forever and ever with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice that the passage doesn't end with this chronological organization of the rapture. The passage says that there's a purpose for us to know this truth. Verse 18 says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. The word comfort is the same word that is translated elsewhere in the Bible by the word encouragement. So we could read that text this way, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Because how many of you know, you can't go through life without hope. You can't go through life without faith. If you don't believe God has a plan for your life, you're going to have a miserable life. And it's not just think so, hope so, womp up your faith. The Bible says faith is the bedrock truth of life. Hebrews 10 says the just live by faith. And I want to tell you something. The rapture of the church and the coming of Christ is the most encouraging doctrine you can ever preach to people who are going through trouble. You know, we're living in some pretty difficult times right now, are we not? And people having kinds of problems they never had before in their life. So in light of what Paul has presented, here's the question we need to ask. How shall we live? If we believe that Jesus is coming back to take us to be with him, how shall we live? Well, first of all, we should be looking for the Lord, shouldn't we? If we believe that, we should be looking for him. We should anticipate it. When was the last time you even thought about the fact that Jesus was coming back? The Bible says in Titus 2.13, we're to be looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.20 says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. And 1 Thessalonians 1 says, we wait for his Son from heaven. Are we looking for Jesus? You know, one of the things that helps you deal with life on earth is to remember that there's life elsewhere. It's life in heaven that God has provided. And keep your eyes on Jesus. Not only should we be looking for Jesus, but the scripture says we should be living for Jesus, shouldn't we? In fact, one of the interesting things about prophecy is wherever you see a prophetic truth in the Bible, almost inevitably married to it is some practical admonition that has been given to us to tell us what to do. For instance, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, 
teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody said, well, if you believe Jesus is coming back, you can just live any way you want. No, you can't. If you really believe that Jesus is coming back, you don't want to be ashamed at his coming. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is coming back for all those who have placed their faith in him. If you have not done that, you will be left behind. Today, you can get your name on the list. You can say, Lord Jesus, I want to receive you as my savior. I don't want to be left behind. I want to go to heaven. When you come back for your own, I want to be included in that number. You say, well, Pastor Jeremiah, that that's a strange thing that you say, that you need to trust Jesus Christ so you can go to heaven. I'm not saying that. I'm just reporting to you what Jesus said. Do you remember what he said? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Do you want to go to heaven when you die? The only way you're going to get there is through Jesus Christ. There's not plan A, plan B, and plan C. There's only one plan. It's God's plan. And the Bible says God has a plan whereby you can go to heaven and spend eternity with him forever and ever and ever. And you can execute that plan right here, right now, right here in this place. And when the rapture comes, you will hear the call, the voice of an archangel, the shout, and the trump of God. And you will be called up to be with him. A prayer from a cave. Say, friend, have you ever been in a cave and uh, lifted your voice? I mean, all over the world, there are places where you go and you walk through caves and see the stalagmites and the stalactites and all the things that are there. And sometimes you're just tempted to say something really loud, and you do, and it echoes all over the place. Can you imagine David in the cave, and all of a sudden, he begins to worship? Um I, I imagine that every time I read this, and I hope I can help you imagine it too. We're going to try to do that here in the next few moments as we conclude our discussion of a prayer from a cave. We're studying the life of David. This is called The Tender Warrior. And for all of you who are uh, veteran listeners, we're only getting to the midway point. We're going to study David's life the rest of June and throughout the month of July, and we want you to be with us every day. There's a study guide for both sections of his life. There are two study guides, actually. Uh, volume 1, Volume 2, you can get these from davidjeremiah.org, along with the CD packages that will give you the audio teaching of the entire life of this incredible man from the Old Testament, David. You may wonder why I love my name. I was named by my parents after David of the Bible. And uh, I don't hold a candle to him, but I look up to him because even with all of the challenges he had, he was a man who loved God. Okay, here we go with part two of A Prayer from a Cave. Hang on, this is a great study. I don't know what there is about a problem, but problems have a tendency to isolate us from others. We build a shell around ourselves and sometimes to our own undoing. We believe that we are unique in that situation. So who can we tell and who will understand? And the more we think on it, the more certain we are that there's not a person in the world who would ever totally understand what we're going through. So though we're surrounded by people, we feel very much alone. I can think back on some problems that I've experienced as a father, as a pastor, when I would deeply desire to have talked to somebody but just didn't know how to go about it, wondering if anybody would really understand. He's totally abandoned, he's hunted by Saul, and he feels alone. And then, because of all of this, David gets depressed. In the sixth verse is the best description for depression I have ever found in the Bible. It's ex exactly what the word means. He said, I am brought very low. What is depression? Well, if you make a depression in something, you press in on it and you leave an indentation. 
When the soul is depressed, when your spirit is depressed, when you are emotionally depressed, it is a low point in your emotional cycle and you get very low. David said he had gone through depression. I, I don't know if I've ever been depressed. I'm, I'm not easily depressed, not really easily discouraged, but I've probably been close enough to it to know that I don't want to be. And I've counseled with people who have suffered with chronic depression and I know that it is a very, very heavy burden to bear. It is what is causing hundreds and thousands of high school young people, teenagers, to end their lives because they see no hope or any reason to go on because of family problems or because of total despair over the future of their own lives because of a lack of purpose and concern for spiritual truth. They look around at a world and to them it's not worth fighting and they get so depressed that finally they despair of their own lives and they're killing themselves by the dozens. David was depressed. All of his hope and all of his joy is gone. The thoughts of his problems have turned inward and now they're no longer out here. Now they're in here. It's no longer Saul is chasing me. It's no longer the 400 men are surrounding me. All of that has somehow come into his spirit and it resides within his own emotions. He may not even be aware that anybody else is around. He is so down and depressed and discouraged. Sometimes we think depression is sin and there are occasions perhaps when it is, but as I've read the history of the great preachers, I've been overwhelmed to discover how many of them had great, great difficulty with depression. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great English preacher, would oftentimes get so depressed that he would have to take two to three months off from his ministry and go to the French Riviera just to be by himself and not even think about anybody or talk about anybody till he finally came out of it. Elijah was depressed, remember, after his great mountaintop experience. Jonah was depressed after he was confronted by God in his disbelief of God's will. I could name others in the Bible. Moses was depressed. Many of God's people have been depressed. David's depressed. And because of that, he has given up. He's just given up. He's in the midst of this situation. He doesn't see any way out. He doesn't see any hope. And so in verse 6, he just kind of looks at the problem and he says, my persecutors are stronger than I am. You see what David has done now, I want you to listen carefully. He's added up the score. He's put everything down over on this side of the ledger. He's looked at all of his problems and you can just see him mentally listening to listening to them. He's got all these people and he's got Saul and he's got this problem and he's got his guilt over what's happened and he's the king elect but it doesn't going to happen that way. And he lists all these things down and he looks at him and he said, listen, there's no hope. When I look at everything that's wrong in my life, every problem I have, I just, I've totaled it up and I'm telling you, I'm going to lose. So he describes his experience in the last verse as being in prison. Now, wait a minute, David, you're not in prison, you're in a cave. Yes, I know, but sometimes your caves become your prisons, don't they? Sometimes the problems you go through literally incarcerate you in the midst of them and you can't get out and there's no way to look and you don't know what to do. And David is right there in his life. This is his low point and he's telling us what it's like. He's telling us honestly what he feels. And we can identify with it because we've walked with him through all these experiences. David is a man after God's own heart. And so when he thinks about Ahimelech the priest and that whole family being annihilated because of his rebellion, David just so overwhelmed with it all. And if we read the Psalm, we, we sure identify, don't we? Some of you here today have been right where David was and some of you are there right now. You may think I've been reading your mail. You may think I've been listening to your conversations because I've just described what's happening with you. Well, folks, I don't want to leave you there. The thing that's so great about this psalm is David kind of works his way through it. I, I want to just show you the beginning and the end of the psalm, and then I want to take you through the steps in between. Verse 1, I cried unto the Lord. 
Verse 7, thou shalt deal bountifully with me. How did David get from the depths of depression to the confidence that he shows in the last verse? Well, at the risk of being very simplistic, let's just watch carefully the steps he walked through. And these are steps which we too can experience. First of all, he verbalized what was going on in his life. I have come to this psalm often and read it often because it reminds me of all the things I don't like to do when I have problems. And I'm reminded that David was a man of God who followed these principles in his own life and shows us the way that we should go when we have difficulty. If you will look through the psalm, you will notice it over and over again. Verse 1, I cried unto the Lord. Verse 2, I poured out my complaint. Verse 5, I cried unto thee. Verse 6, attend unto my cry. What is David doing? He's telling God what's going on. You say, doesn't God know? Oh, yes, he knows. Why is it so hard for us to do that? Why do we struggle? Some of you here today have a problem that's overwhelming to you. It's bigger than you can bear, but you cannot bring yourself to tell anybody what's happening, and you haven't even told God. Before God, we speak our minds fully and name the problems and the people that plague us. Why do we do that? First of all, I do it because the best friend I have in the universe is the God of heaven. He knows, and I can say to him anything that's in my heart. Isn't that what a true friend is? A true friend is somebody to whom you can go, pour out your heart, and say everything that you want to say. And as one writer has said, they will keep the wheat and blow the chaff away. Do you have anybody that you can get in the car with and lock the door, roll up the windows, and you vent? And you say, I want to tell you what is going on in my life. Here's what I feel. And you can scream if you want to. And holler and cry. That's what God is for us. You say, Pastor, that doesn't sound very spiritual. But I want to tell you something. You can't get to verse 7 if you don't walk through that step until you get to the place where you can tell God what you feel as honestly as you know how to say it. And I'm not talking about chronic complaining or negative uh, begging of God. I'm simply saying oftentimes we don't come to God with our problem. We don't cry out to God from the cave. One of my favorite people has always been Joseph Bailey. Joe Bailey for years wrote a column for Eternity Magazine. He's written many books, some of them on the family. Joe Bailey suffered a great deal in his life. He lost three of his children through terrible, tragic accidents. And he wrote a book called A View from the Hearse, describing what he went through in his pain. But he was such a great writer because he just put down on paper the way it was. And he's got a book called The Psalms of My Life, things that he wrote while he was walking through life. And one particular psalm he wrote while he was traveling across the country on a speaking and writing tour. He was all by himself, and these are his words. Listen carefully. I'm alone, Lord, all alone. A thousand miles from home, there's no one here who knows my name except the clerk, and he spelled it wrong. No one to eat dinner with, no one to laugh at my jokes, Listen to my gripes. Be happy with me about what happened today and say that's great. No one cares. There's just this lousy bed and slush in the street outside and between the buildings. I feel sorry for myself and I've plenty of reason to. Maybe I ought to say I'm on top of it. Praise the Lord. Things are great, but they're not. Tonight, it's all gray slush. Not much of a psalm, but surely a good way to express what the man felt. He verbalized what was happening in his heart. Do you do that? Have you listened to your prayers lately? Some of you are hurting so desperately today. I know some of your hurts. When was the last time you closed the door, locked it, got on your knees, and just told God what you were feeling? Some of you feel abandoned by him. 
Some of you think God has forgotten about you. You've gone through so many difficult things that you wonder if God really cares. Have you told him? That's where it starts. That's how it begins. I want you to notice the second thing that he does is he, he kind of visualizes this whole thing before God. Verse 2. He says, I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. That's a very important verse. I'd like to ask you to let me show you what I think he's doing. Here's his trouble in this little book. <laughs> and David says he goes before God and he just turns the book around. and He says, here, God, here it is. This is what's wrong. Look at it. Will you look at it? But the key to the verse is that he did it before God. And in the picture, if you can see it, are David's troubles laid out. And in the picture is God. One of the dangers we have in our praying is that we rush quickly into our supplication and intercession before we go to praise. And I've warned you about that, and we've talked much about it, especially when we're studying the Lord's Prayer. How carefully God has protected in the pattern of praying that worship comes first. That's not just because it's an arbitrary thing of God. L listen to me now. If we do not praise God, if we do not worship God, if we do not adore God in the beginning of our praying, we will not be showing our problems before him. The purpose of praise is not only because God alone is worthy of it, but praise has a tendency to make God big in our hearts and in our minds and in our spiritual being so that when we finally pass through the gates of praise and thanksgiving and we enter into the disclosure of our problems, we are pouring out our problems before a great and mighty God. If I visualize my problems without God in the picture, I'm depressed. And truly, much praying can be depressing because we give God the grocery list of all of our problems and we've forgotten the greatness of the one to whom we pray. But David said, I showed my problems before him. I poured them out before God. I think of the, the story of Kadesh Barnea in the Old Testament. Now the spies went in to check out the land <laughs> and the majority report came back. <laughs> they said, we're dead. We're dead. We've checked out the opposition and we're like grasshoppers before them. We haven't got a chance. And then Joshua and Caleb, stubborn men of faith, came back and they said, listen, we looked at those guys and it's a piece of cake. We have a great God. They may be big to us, but they're not big to God. And after all, it's God's problem. And God can take care of it. All we got to do is trust him. And the majority wouldn't believe, and they ended up wandering around the wilderness for 40 years because of their unbelief. But those two men, God blessed. You know what the difference between the two reports was? The first group saw their problems in respect to their own resources and were frightened. But Joshua and Caleb saw the problem in respect to the resources of God, and they were encouraged and had faith. The best thing I can do when I have a problem, and I feel like I'm in the cave and the prison of my own difficulties, is to spend as much time as I can praising God, exalting Him, honoring Him, glorifying Him, reading the great passages that build the picture of God as He really is, and then in the context of that kind of a God, I tell him my problems. <laughs> David continues. He is beginning to get confidence in his own spirit. Notice in the third verse, he begins to recognize something about God. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. He begins to think about the fact that what he's going through is known to God. God, I, I know I've told you all of this today, and I've showed you all of this today, but it suddenly dawns on me that you know this. You know me, and you care about me, and you're interested in me. And as we read in Job 23.10, He knoweth the way that I take, and when He hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Or Psalm 37.23, The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and He delighteth in His way. 
As David pours out his soul to God and cries out to God in the midst of the cave, he suddenly begins to understand that the one to whom he speaks is the priest. The one to whom he speaks is the one who knows, who understands. And so he begins to realize the provision that he has in God. Notice verse 5, I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, watch this, thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. What is happening to David? Do you see how he's working through this thing in his life? He's in the cave, he's surrounded by the enemy, he's depressed and discouraged, but he begins to tell God what he feels. He begins to show God what he feels. He begins to understand that God knows what he feels. And then he begins to realize in his own mind that because he is talking to such a great God, that that's where the answer lies. Thou art my portion and my refuge in the land of the living. I heard an old preacher one time preach this psalm, and it blessed my soul. He said, there's no living in the land of the living like living on the living God. <laughs> and he was right. That's what the psalmist said. Thou art my portion and my refuge in the land of the living. And finally, David comes to seventh verse, and, and he finishes up the psalm, and he's arrived at the place of victory over all of this. Bring my soul out of prison, watch this, that I may praise thy name, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. From depression to praise, from problems to praise. And I like to believe that when David finished writing Psalm 142, he took a break and he came back and wrote Psalm 57. Turn over to Psalm 57. We haven't but a moment to look at it, and we're just going to look at two verses. David is learning that God can be trusted in times of danger. And as he has talked about his problem to God, he now writes this great hymn of exciting praise to the Lord. Now, this hymn has two verses, and in between the two verses is a chorus. Verse 1 of the song is verses 1 through 4 in the psalm, and verse 2 is verses 6 through 11 and at the end of each verse there is the chorus the chorus is in verse 5 be thou exalted O God above the heavens let thy glory be above all the earth and then there's the second verse and the chorus again in verse 11 be thou exalted O God above the heavens let thy glory be above all the earth well, you see we don't have much a different pattern in our singing today than they did back then we sing a verse and then we sing the chorus we sing the verse and then we sing the chorus but notice what is going on in the verses. Verse 1, Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. That's where David is at the end of Psalm 142. He's now trusting in God. In the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities are over. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. Those are the 400 to 600 men he's with. And I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue is a sharp sword. But be thou exalted, O God. Above the heavens, let thy glory be above all the earth. They've prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They've digged a pit for me. In the midst thereof, they have fallen themselves. My heart is fixed, O oh God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations, for thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. I like to imagine the Bible. Here's this huge cave. <laughs> It has an echo in it. And here are these 400 rough men. And David says, all right, everyone, listen up. It's time for choir rehearsal. Huh. All the tenors over here. 
we're going to sing. And at first, it didn't sound like much. But then they sang it again and again until that whole cave resounded with the praise of God in heaven. I don't know if you've ever been in a group where hundreds of men sing together. I remember uh, years ago, the early Promise Keepers rallies where we would go to major stadiums and thousands of men would be there and they would sing praise to God and just send chills up your spine because it's an incredible sound. And we have a men's ministry here at Shadow Mountain where about uh, 400 men gather every Tuesday night to worship and then study the Word of God. And when I listen to these guys praise the Lord, there's nothing like it. I can't imagine what it would have been like for David that day after going through all he'd been through to hear these men help him worship God. Well, tomorrow we're going to take a moment and talk about how to treat your enemy from 1 Samuel 24. Um, join us. This is another one of those intriguing segments of David's life. I hope you'll be with us tomorrow as we open together the Bible and the Turning Point Study Hall. I'm David Jeremiah. Thanks for listening. Today's message originated from Shadow Mountain Community Church and senior pastor, Dr. David Jeremiah. If Turning Point is helping you to grow your faith, Please share it with us by writing to Turning Point, P.O. Box 3838, San Diego, California, 92163. Visiting our website at davidjeremiah.org slash radio or calling 800-947-1993. Ask for your copy of The Focus Life, a month of daily readings from Psalms and Proverbs in a beautiful leather-bound book, yours for a gift of any amount. You can also stream more than 1,200 of Dr. Jeremiah's messages on demand on any screen with our streaming service, Turning Point Plus, all for a monthly gift of any amount. Visit turningpointplus.org for details. This is David Michael Jeremiah. Join us tomorrow as we continue the series, The Tender Warrior, on Turning Point with Dr. David Jeremiah. Have you ever felt like hiding someplace where your troubles can't find you? King David did, and for him, that someplace was a cave. Today on Turning Point, Dr. David Jeremiah takes you inside that cave where David poured his heart out to the Lord and turned his problems into praises. From The Tender Warrior, here's David to introduce today's inspiring message, A Prayer from a Cave. You know, one of the things I've learned about the Psalms over the years, and I don't know who said this, but somebody gave this to me, either in a book or in a message. They said, every Psalm starts out with a sigh and ends with a song. And boy, is that ever true of what we're about to study. Here is David in the cave. He's at the lowest point. He thinks he's away from Saul, away from his enemies, away from everybody, alone, just with his um, band of uh, security guards. <laughs> and there he is. And all of a sudden, he discovers he's not alone. He's joined by a group of people you wouldn't want to have at your worst day. And God uses that experience. And we end up at the end of this particular episode in his life with David hosting a worship service. Can you believe it? We'll get to it in just a moment. But first, let me remind you that during this month, our special resource for the month is a beautiful, beautiful book of reading for you. Uh, in the New Living Translation from Tyndall, this is a beautiful rendition of the Psalms and Proverbs. And we've done this in such a way. I, I discovered this from a friend of mine who had a copy of this and used to carry it with him with pictures of people he prayed for in the back of the book. And he told me all about how this had blessed his life. And I found out where he got it, contacted the publisher, and they agreed to republish it so that we could make it available to you. It's five psalms followed by a chapter from Proverbs. Five more psalms, a chapter from Proverbs. Read through the psalms and the Proverbs every month. It'll change your life. The psalms will help you understand God. The Proverbs will help you keep your feet on the ground and walk with men and figure out stuff that you need to know. So I encourage you to take this opportunity and get this beautiful leather-covered edition 
we call this the focus life. Focus on God, focus on life. And it's yours for the asking when you send a gift of any size to Turning Point during this month. Now, if you've noticed, uh, we're moving through the month of June pretty quickly. When you tell the story of a man like David, time flies. So don't wait too long. I want you to have this. This is a great resource for you as a believer, especially in the midst of all that we're facing today. It will have such a calming and encouraging effect on your life. Read it before you go to bed at night. Read it when you get up in the morning and let its truth wash over your soul. Once again, it's yours for the asking when you send a gift. Okay, here we go. This is a prayer from a cave. The life of David is a great encouragement to all of us because he mirrors to a great extent many of the expressions and feelings of our own hearts. As you know, David is a man of great faith and a man of great vision. But he's also a man who struggles on occasion with the gap between his belief and his behavior. As we met the last time we were together to talk about his life, we, we saw David at probably the lowest point until the sin with Bathsheba. He has run away from Saul. He has left the security of Samuel. He has found his place before a priest by the name of Ahimelech. He defiles himself in many respects before that man of God by lying to him. He eats the showbread because that's all there is available for his sustenance. He involves a man by the name of Dog in mass murder and because of his disobedience to God, the entire priestly line of Ahimelech was destroyed. From that experience, he went to the Philistine city of Gath and there came before Achish, the king of the Philistines. And when he had on the sword that had belonged to Goliath, who was an inhabitant of Gath, the people recognized immediately that this was the David who had killed their hero. And in order to escape with his life, David had to make out as if he were crazy. And the scripture tells us that he banged his head against the door of the cities and, and he slobbered in his beard. He runs from Achish and now we find him at the beginning of the 22nd chapter taking refuge in a cave. The 22nd chapter of 1 Samuel is a very interesting chapter because throughout the chapter we see God trying to teach David that he can be trusted by him. In the first two verses we see God trying to teach David that he can be trusted in his own danger, that God is worthy of his trust. In verses 3 through 5 we have an interesting experience where David takes his parents to Moab and leaves them with the king of Moab so that they will take care of his parents while he's in trouble, while he's a, a fugitive from Saul. It's quite interesting to discover that he took his parents to Moab because that was the place where his grandmother, Ruth, had been. And he no doubt had relatives there and knew about the city. The rest of the chapter, beginning at the sixth verse, shows how God can take care of a person when it seems like every evil thing in the world is against him. We studied part of that chapter the last time we met together. But today, I want us to look again at just the first two verses. In my estimation, it is a representative experience for many of us. For most of us are at one time or another at the very place where David finds himself. This Psalm, Psalm 142, is one of three Psalms that David probably wrote from the cave experience. Psalm 142, Psalm 57, and perhaps even Psalm 34. If you have been watching carefully in our study and brief exposition of some of the Psalms as we have touched upon them, you know that invariably as we have gone through the life of David, we have called these Psalms Miktim or Mikkil Psalms. The word is the word that you will find in the superscription over the Psalm, and it means a teaching Psalm. Psalm 142 is the last of the teaching psalms. There are 14 of them altogether. In fact, David wrote eight psalms while he was on the run. The psalms of the fugitive David total eight in number. And these three that we're going to look briefly at today were written by David while he was running from Saul and hiding out in a cave. Now in 1 Samuel 22 and verse 1, we are told that David is in the cave of Adullam. 
And there are two caves into which David finds his refuge. One is the cave of Adullam, which takes place in that which we're going to look at today. And the other is called the cave of Engede. And that's where David cut off Saul's skirt when Saul didn't know he was around and then used that to prove that he wasn't Saul's enemy. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 22 that David departed and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. Now most scholars believe that Saul had levied a heavy tax upon the inhabitants of Israel and many of these people who were in debt and discontented and distressed were victims of the high taxation and were struggling for their very existence. They were friends of David from the past and when they heard David was in exile hiding out in the cave, they decided to go join him. It should be evident to all of us at once that this was not your one man cave. The cave of Adullam is still in existence today and if you were to go and visit it you would discover that the mouth of the cave is some 20 feet wide and the height of the cave is some 40 feet. A place quite large enough for 400 people to gather. It is also interesting to discover that when the word got out of these 400 men who had gathered to David in the cave of Adullam that they began to grow in number for when you come to the 23rd chapter of 1 Samuel and verse 13, you will learn that this number has now grown to 600 men. What a group. What a wonderful bunch of people to have come and minister to you when you're down. I couldn't help but think this week that in this situation, David is like Robin Hood and these men are like the Contras. What a group. Renegades, rebels. And they have all come there because David is there. Now David has become their leader. I do not know which of the Psalms David wrote first from the cave, but it seems apparent that he wrote Psalm 142 first. And so if you have your Bibles open to the Psalms in Psalm 142, we need to look at what's going on in the mind of David as he experiences this cave experience. Some of you may say to me, Pastor, what do I care about what goes on in a man's heart when he's in a cave? And perhaps you have forgotten that all of us have our caves, every one of us. For some of us, it is the cave of physical distress and infirmity. For others, it's the cave of financial reverse and discouragement. For still others, it's the cave of family distress and upheaval and rebellion. I don't know what the cave is for you, but everyone has them. Everyone moves in the direction of the cave on occasion. Cannot escape them. There are moments when we are down under all of the pressures of life and we seek for refuge. I cannot help believe that David went to that cave to be alone. He wanted to get away from everybody. And the next thing he knows, he's surrounded by all of these wonderful counselors that have come to be a part of his life. And because David is a poetic fellow, he tells us what he feels. I have a poet in my family. It's my oldest daughter, Jan. And when she writes me letters, they are so rich with color and beauty and I know everything that's going on in her heart. She's the most descriptive of all the Jeremiah's. And uh, I don't have to doubt about what she feels because she puts it down in writing and she does it beautifully and that's the poetic genius of David. You know, if it had been me, I would have just said in a little subscription, you know, life in the cave is the pits <laughs> and let it go at that. David put down in writing everything he felt, what he was going through, what it was like, what his emotions were. And I'm glad he did because it helps me comprehend what was going through his heart at the time. It also helps me to see how he dealt with it. In the 142nd Psalm, David talks about the condition of his soul during this period of time. He was, first of all, disoriented. Notice what it says in your Bible in verse 3. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me. Do you know what that means? The Hebrew of that particular phrase it literally says in the
muffling of my spirit upon me. David felt like some fierce flood had rushed down upon him. He can barely stand up against the might of it. He's overwhelmed. He's disoriented. When my way and my spirit is so wrapped in trouble and gloom, so muffled with woe, my powers of judgment are baffled. Literally, that's what it means. He's disoriented. Have you ever gone through disorientation? <laughs> I don't know exactly what it's like at its total depth, but it's something like coming home from a trip and seeing your desk piled high with papers. And walking in and sitting down and looking at them all and sort of feeling like, there's too much, there's no way. I know I should start this, I don't know where to start, so I don't think I will. So you just sit there and look at them. Only David's disorientation is at a much deeper level. He's so cumbered with problems and difficulties. He's being chased by the king of Israel with the army of Israel. And now he's got all these sorry people around him that he doesn't really want, but that have come down to be a part of him, and he ends up being their leader. He's got all these personal problems, probably overrun with guilt because of the death of Ahimelech's family. And he says, I just, I'm just disoriented. Say, have you been there? Have you ever been there? Have you ever gone through that part of the cave? David said when he continued to think about his situation, he went through a period of total desertion, feeling as if he was all alone. This is probably the saddest verse in the Psalms. Look at the fourth verse. He said, I looked on my right hand, and behold, there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Now, wait a minute, David. There are 400 people and more are coming every day. <laughs> what do you mean nobody's around? How can you be surrounded by people <laughs> and be alone? I'll never forget a trip my wife and I took one time years past to London. And we went to Piccadilly Square right in the rush hour when all the work got out and everybody was running for the train. And we were standing right in the middle of a million people, they said. And we didn't know a soul. And I got in the uh, train, and, and Donna kind of got caught in the crowd, and I had a hold of her hand, but I couldn't see her. And I wasn't going to let go of her hand because I thought I might never see her again. And I finally held on to her and pulled her body in, and we got in the train, and we were smushed in with all those people, and I felt very, very alone, surrounded by more people than I'd been in the presence of in all my life, and yet very much alone. Sometimes our problems can do that to us, can't they? David said, I looked on my right hand, who am I going to talk to? I looked on my left hand and they don't understand. You know what he said? There's not one person in this whole group that cares for my soul. I don't know what there is about a problem, but problems have a tendency to isolate us from others. We build a shell around ourselves and sometimes to our own undoing. We believe that we are unique in that situation. So who can we tell and who will understand? And the more we think on it, the more certain we are that there's not a person in the world who would ever totally understand what we're going through. So though we're surrounded by people, we feel very much alone. I can think back on some problems that I've experienced as a father, as a pastor, when I would deeply desire to have talked to somebody but just didn't know how to go about it wondering if anybody would really understand he's totally abandoned he's hunted by Saul and he feels alone and then because of all of this David gets depressed in the sixth verse is the best description for depression I have ever found in the Bible it's ex exactly what the word means he said I am brought very low. What is depression? Well, if you make a depression in something, you press in on it and you leave an indentation. When the soul is depressed, when your spirit is depressed, when you are emotionally depressed, it is a low point in your emotional cycle and you get very low. David said he had gone through depression. I don't know if I've ever been depressed. I'm not easily depressed. Not really easily discouraged, but I've probably been close enough to it to know that I don't want to be. And I've counseled with people who have suffered with chronic depression, and I know that it is a very, very heavy burden to bear. It is what is causing hundreds and thousands of high school young people, teenagers, 
to end their lives because they see no hope or any reason to go on because of family problems or because of total despair over the future of their own lives because of a lack of purpose and concern for spiritual truth. They look around at a world and to them it's not worth fighting and they get so depressed that finally they despair of their own lives and they're killing themselves by the dozens. David was depressed. All of his hope and all of his joy is gone. The thoughts of his problems have turned inward. And now they're no longer out here. Now they're in here. It's no longer Saul is chasing me. It's no longer the 400 men are surrounding me. All of that has somehow come into his spirit and it resides within his own emotion.